Today we're going to be doing some hydrolog hydrologic analysis with rasters with digital elevation models. And so this lab has um, a bunch of different items in it under uh, this week's module. Here's the main document for the lab. I also have put a stream stats tutorial in there. Um, you can use stream stats. I think we're going to bring in stream stats, um, which delineates watersheds based on, I think, a 10 meter DEM. And you can bring that in um, from stream stats, an online web app, and compare the watershed that stream stats does with the watershed that you will do with this lab. Um, so if you haven't been exposed to stream stats, then, then check out that tutorial. For this lab, we will um, be working with a 10 by 10 meter DEM of Canna Creek watershed. So this is the creek that drains off of the west side of the Mesa. We'll do a quick, a short write up, um, describe the data set being used, um, talk about the major tools that we're using. We're gonna be going through this kind of workflow to um, create a watershed. And then there's gonna be some prompts uh, below. So look for these um, italic bold prompts as you go. Um, finally, um, you'll create a map with a layout and all the legend, scale bar, north arrow of the watershed. And ultimately, we'll have a watershed and streamlines that we're delineating. Um, first step, though, is, is to watch this video. This is, um, I give you two videos right here, so you can choose um, one of these. There's also a, a YouTube page for this data set. And the data set is called the National Hydrography Data Set. And what it is, is basically um, streamlined. When you, when you, for example, when you um, zoom in on stream stats, you see kind of a gridded streamline that is based off of the National Hydrography Data Set. So it's a data set of hydrography. So hydro is water, graphy is mapping. Um, or drawing, and we're when we say hydrography, we're talking about maps or um, you know we're representations of hydrologic features. And so that data set has uh, maps of all the lakes and ponds, all the streams for the country. It's pretty old school. It's based off of some really coarse resolution data, and in the next five or so years, it's going to be updated with lidar, which is really high resolution. It's going to be much more accurate. But it's a data set that's used for a lot of modeling, watershed modeling applications and um, stream, um, stream assessments and that kind of thing. So it's basically the, the map of the streams or GIS data file, the streams of the, of the nation. So I just want you to dig into that and kind of learn a little bit more about hydro, hydrographic data sets and write a little response to one of those videos. All right, so after you do that, we'll do the... Um, We'll actually download the data. So here's your data set. I've already downloaded it and unzipped it. Um, and then we're going to look at hydrologic analysis or hydrographic analysis in ARC. So I'm going to pull this website up real quick. And these are, I give you PDF files for these web pages um, to review. We're going to be using a series of hydrologic modeling tools or geospatial tools in ArcGIS to take a digital elevation model and develop watersheds and stream networks just based on that digital elevation model. So gridded streams. Here's your, your DEM uh, elevation model. And then uh, we go through these steps. And I'll just kind of walk through the steps real quick and then we'll do it. The first step is to generate a flow direction. And what this is, is a map that shows for each grid cell, what direction is it facing? And this can have different values. It could be north, northeast. It could have a, a, basically a number code associated with each of those grid cells. Or it could just have a, a one, um, uh, it could be continuous, you know, one to 360 degrees or just integer degrees. So that flow direction tool, why, why do you think we want to know the flow direction of a raster? We'll start with Zach. It's the speed of when it rains, which direction the runoff is going to go. Yeah, where does it go? Because ultimately, if we want to get a drainage network, we want to know where all the water goes as it runs off this surface. And that DEM has a cell you know, right here, and then a cell below it, and a cell below it. And so you could imagine mathematically you can um, 
you can say which direction water would flow. So this is the first step in that, and it's the flow direction. So where does water run off if it hits the surface? Now we do um, a sink analysis, and what sinks are are basically they're they're when you when you think about a, a, a raster or a digital elevation model, and you're scanning um, the surface of our landscape. And what happens when you come across a bridge or a culvert or something that crosses a road? What, how is that represented in the raster, Edgar? Just thinking about that. You could have different returns, but if it's just like bridge, it's just concrete, right? You're just gonna have one return, which is on the deck of the bridge. So if you think about that 3D model, what would it look like if you're gonna go come down the river it's a hump, right? And that would kind of be like a dam. But in reality, it's not. Because in, in a digital elevation model, at least in you know, the basic ones that we have, there's only one value per cell. You can't be the bottom of the river and then the top of the bridge for one cell. You only have one elevation value. So either culverts, road crossings, um, or just kind of variation or, or coarseness in the raster, we're gonna end up with um, a lot of sinks. And a sink is basically a place where water collects and then can't go, right? Because it's just, a, it's, a, it's like a pit, right? In the, in the um, digital elevation model. And so there's tools that we can use to um, deal with sinks and remove them. And that's called conditioning or hydrologic conditioning. And so we want to make sure that water can flow um, through the landscape or numerically when we do this raster analysis so that all the flow directions end up in a flow path. And what that ends up doing is two ways to do it. One is called cutting and cutting is finding those sinks and basically just burning, um, removing a depth from the elevation model so that water can flow through. So it's like, you know, blowing up the bridge basically um, from a, raster math standpoint, that can be a little challenging because it's kind of more, you have to do it piece by piece. And the other way is to fill. And so we'll be using the fill tool that basically says, okay, here's a sink. I'm gonna raise the elevation like I would if water were to come through and just raise the elevation until it meets the top and then you can flow over. So it's an algorithm that kind of iteratively sweeps through and, and finds and removes sinks. So that's the tool we'll use. It, it, it can introduce anomalies. So say if you have a really flat, wide floodplain that has a bridge on it, it's gonna fill that floodplain up and you'll lose maybe the meandering path. It's almost like if you were to flood it, right? You lose the channel. And so you would end up getting basically a straight line all the way across that, that floodplain uh, upstream of the bridge. So that might not represent the actual river footprint. All right, so once we've removed the sinks, we now have a, a raster that's hydrologically conditioned, meaning water can flow from the upstream end of any point and make it all the way down from a numerical standpoint. Um, we can then use the flow direction raster um, um, to delineate uh, watersheds, drainage areas. And so with the flow direction raster, you basically create, um, you know, from every point, you know what's upstream. Right, as you can follow the directions upstream. So we can create watersheds. We can create a flow accumulation raster. This one's really important. Using the flow direction raster, every grid cell in this raster has a value for how many grid cells are upstream. So you click on this grid cell and it says there are you know, 10,582 um, grid cells that drain to this particular point. And that comes directly from the flow direction raster. And that's really important because then that allows us to say, okay, what's the drainage area? We can say streams. At what point do we want streams to exist based on a drainage area threshold? So you can say, okay, draw me all the streams. You can do a logical argument and say, okay, anything above this many grid cells, you could convert this to area. Um, and let's talk about how we would do that. How would you convert... Um, a flow accumulation raster where the units, the values of each raster cell is just the number of grid cells upstream. How would you convert that to a drainage area?
Yeah. Yeah. So if you know the cell size, 10 by 10 meters, then you multiply that by you use the raster calculator and then multiply that grid cell area by the number of grid cells. So if it's 10,000 grid cells, each one of those is 10 by 10 meters, then you could do meters squared, you could do kilometers squared or miles squared, depending on that. Um, so we can use this again as a threshold. We can say, here's a logical argument where it says, okay, anything with more than a hundred grid cells is one and everything else is zero. And then that will create streamlines, which is the same thing we see in stream stats. So stream stats has those little gridded cells representing the stream up to a certain drainage area threshold. And there's no um, answer for when does a stream start? It depends on so many different things. Um, when we do GIS analysis, we might use this really as just kind of a visual. Um, you could go out and, and look on a map where you see a channel start and calculate the drainage area and then kind of do a little study there um, if that's something that's important to do. Uh, two other things I'll talk about. Um, one is with that stream network, we can create stream order maps. And we talked about this in hydrology. Stream order is um, how many streams connect to that stream. And so as we kind of go down, we can build our order. So these little um, dark blue ones would be a first order stream. Where two first order streams come together, we get a second. Where two second order streams come together, we get a third and so forth. And so this stream order tool uses um, an algorithm to determine order based on kind of a network connection thing. And then lastly, this is kind of interesting. This is what, um, when we use stream stats to calculate flow paths and times of concentration, what they use underneath is a raster that says flow length. And this is a raster that says you click anywhere on this, it'll tell you how long, what's the distance between that point in the raster and either the outlet or the up, upstream bend, and the, the ridge of the boundary of the watershed. And that's kind of an interesting thing. And so you could use this then to um, say, okay, I'm gonna click here and it's gonna tell me the flow path length up to here. So that would be like 300 feet for the first flow path in hydrology. And then you could do a downstream flow path length and click on that and it would say, okay, from here to here, we have you know, um, shallow concentrated flow for doing time of concentration. And here's where the channel starts. I'm gonna click on that. And it'll tell me how long that flow path is and in the channel all the way to the outlet. So that's just an overview of kind of the, the workflow that we'll be doing. There's a ton of other things you can do um, with raster hydrology. That's the, that's the basics. Um, here's the actual workflow. And I've got this printed out as a PDF. So you can refer back to this. I also give these steps in um, a little more kind of higher level in the tutorial document. Um, and then here's just another overview of the workflow. So um, you start with a DEM, you have a flow direction tool, you take a flow direction raster, we do the sync tool, we check for sinks. If there are no sinks, um, then we're good and we can um, um, continue to uh, the next step. But it, you might have to run that more than one time. So you run the fill tool again, check for sinks, and then you have ultimately once you have no sinks, you have a hydrologically conditioned DEM, meaning we have flow paths all the way down to the outlet. There's no quote unquote dams. Once we have that hydrologically conditioned DEM, we run the flow direction tool again, because you can imagine that if you ran it the first time and there was a, a road that looked like a dam, then um, it would show flow going into itself, right? It wouldn't just be downstream. So we'd have flow coming off the dam this way and flow coming down the river this way. So we run that tool again. Um, we do the flow accumulation tool. Um, to actually create watersheds, we need um, what's called a pour point. Pour means I wanna pour water down to this point. And so that's a point you create. It's kind of like when you go to stream stats and you click on a point um, on the map, on the grid cells where the stream is, that's creating a pour point. 
And so it'll delineate a watershed upstream in that. So then you can run the watershed tool and then get a watershed. Um, I'll, I'll, I won't go through this one, but this is um, stream, um, stream features, how to create streams from rasters. Okay. All right, so we've created a new map and I've downloaded and unzipped the data from Canvas into this folder. So I call the folder raster hydrology. The data in that zip file is a, a DEM. So let's drag that in. We also have um, a polygon. Let's see what that is. Okay, that's the clipping polygon I used, okay. And then we have a four point file, which is just a one dot, which we'll use to delineate the watershed upstream. What's that? Um, don't worry about the polygon. I don't think we needed that. I use that to clip the raster. I think that's just a, a relic. So the first thing we'll do, we're on step four now, we'll create a hydrologically conditioned DEM. And figure one shows that workflow. That's from the website I showed earlier. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll go to geoprocessing tools and we'll do flow direction. Creates a raster of flow direction. Put our DM in there. Oh, there we go. And then there's some flow types. Um, let's see if I specify which type. Okay. So D8 refers to direction eight, and that's basically the eight directions on a compass, north, northeast, um, east, southeast, south, et cetera, right? So that's eight directions. And that means you just get numbers one through eight. There's other ways to do it. Um, D infinity would just be like, it's continuous, meaning you, you get like a, 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 an angle with, bunch of decimal points kind of a thing. Um, so we won't get into this different practice. We can just keep it at DA just to keep it simple. Go ahead and run that. Some of these tools can take a minute to run. I think the flow accumulation tool takes a while. Just a heads up. And then while we're doing that, um, let's see here. Um, we're gonna go through this, this workflow of um, flow direction, um, fill, sink analysis, just to see if we have any sinks. So we may have to do that a couple of times. So question is define a sink, describe how this tool works. We talked about that few minutes ago. And then the other question is describe what a hydrologically conditioned DEM is and what you accomplish by doing this, this workflow. What I love about this um, work is that it creates some pretty trippy looking um, raster. So here's, here it is in black and white. I'm going to go ahead and change that and we'll do some other, we'll do some fun stuff with it. Let's see. There we go. So let, let's, let's just look at these values. If I click on one of these values, it gives me, um, so 128, 16, eight, one. So these values represent the um, four, the, the eight kind of quadrants. I think the biggest value is uh, 255 maybe, I don't know what it is. But these are kind of like binary values, two to the power of something. 
Um, but, and there's really only eight values in here. Let's just, let me just look, I should create an image of that. So D8 flow direction. Okay, here, let me just, um, I'm gonna plop this in. This is, this is what's going on right here. So for D8, we have different code values. So one is east, 128 is northeast. And so each grid cell has one of these codes. Um, and what's going on is if the raster values have these different elevations, then it, for, for a given cell, the value in that cell is assigned to which one of these eight directions water would flow off. So in this case, and this here's our cell in the middle. So it's surrounded by eight different cells. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, then the value for this particular cell would be two because the flow is going off in the south east direction. So you have that many options of, of what these codes could be. It's always gonna go, yeah, to the lowest. And yeah, you could have like, if you have two cells that are exact same elevation downstream, then um, there's different methods to deal with that. This method is pretty rudimentary. And so I don't know what the algorithm would be, but because it's like a continuous, you know, the elevation values in the raster are continuous. Like if I um, click on any value, you can see it has like six decimal points, right? So they're, they're never gonna be exactly the same. It's always gonna find the lowest path down. All right, so that's our flow direction value raster and it really only has eight. Um, we can do discrete and we get, we get our one through eight values. All right, now we're going to do fill. Let's go to geoprocessing and do fill. And note that these tools are under spatial analysis. They might be 3D analysis too. So we, we if, if you get a warning about a license, you might have to go back and um, I give some instructions on Canvas about how to activate that license. So Phil, make sure that there's no dams in your DEM. And actually let's go ahead and before we do Phil, let's just go look at um, Hillshade. Let's make a Hillshade for Canna Creek using the, the DEM. And let's see if we can find any dams that need to be filled. Yeah, so here's Canna Creek. Um, that might be something right there, right? If I did, um, I, I won't take the time to do it, but if I did like a transect through here, you can actually see, look, here's the creek. It looks like it disappears, right? And so that would be a, a sink. And that might just be, this is a 10 meter DM, it's pretty rough. That's the Gunnison River. But there could be little examples really anywhere where it, it kind of disappears. So there's a bridge right there. That could be a problem. There's another bridge. So those will all be sinks. Um, let's go to fill. And let's look at the info right there. Input raster representing continuous service. We just need the DEM there. So we'll do Canna Creek DEM. We might do this a couple times. It's gonna call, it says fill Canna one. So I've run the fill tool and it created a new DM. So this is our, our filled DM. I'm gonna do Hillshade again and let's just see what's different about it. 
We'll put in the filled DM right there. Go ahead and run that. And then I'm gonna zoom back into where we were. So you can see how, let's just go back to the other hillshade. Um, here's that uh, tributary coming in and you can see how there's a bit of a dam right there from a road crossing. It filled in, you see that? So just, it's basically like ponding it with water. So that's what we did. We're gonna run the sink tool to see if there's any sinks left. Oh, we have to do the flow direction again. Yeah, so we'll do flow direction again. And that's gonna be of the filled raster. So that's gonna be um, fill can of creek right there. All right, we ran the flow direction tool on the fill DM. Now we'll run the sync tool. So the, the new flow direction raster, run that. Let's see, let's see if we have any syncs. So I've run the sync tool and it gives me back a raster. Note that the raster, um, I don't think it has any data in it. it. It goes from a really high number to a really low number. And I think the way this works is if you did have syncs, then you would have basically like one, two, three, four, or just number them. So this, this is indicating to me that we don't have any sinks. So I think we're in good shape. The next step then is that we have, well, we, we finished this first workflow. We have a hydrologically conditioned DEM. And maybe we should run sync on the original one and just see what that looks like, just so we can be sure. Here's our original flow direction one. So let's just run that. So I ran the sync tool for, um, and I'll just make this a color. I ran the sync tool for the original DM. And what it did is it, we, it found 24,440 sinks. And I'll just overlay that over the original hillshade. So it found all these sinks. And some of these are actual ponds. You can see there's some lakes on top of the mesa. That's a reservoir right there. But if you zoom in, it found all these little sinks, you know, in the creek and roadway. So there's actually quite a few, quite a few sinks there. Um, again, this is a 10 meter DEM. So it's pretty coarse resolution. It's kind of glossing over the channel bed and that sort of thing. So when we ran this, the sink tool again, after we filled it, and here's the filled DM versus the, um, the unfilled. We removed those sinks. We ran the tool again, we didn't get any, any sinks. So now we're ready for this second workflow. We've got our hydrologically conditioned DEM. Um, we've already ran the um, flow direction on it, which is this one right here. So that's our flow direction on the, the filled DEM, flow direction fill. Now we can do the flow accumulation tool. And, and the flow accumulation tool is what tells us, it takes this flow direction tool and basically sums it up. It sums the flow paths up for each grid cell. And it says, okay, for each grid cell, how many drain to that grid cell? So let's do that flow accumulation. So here's our um, new flow direction raster from the filled DEM. I'll call it flow accumulation fill. We'll ignore the weight raster. Um, each cell, this would be like, do you wanna put more weight for certain drainage paths or something like that? That, that can get complicated. Output data type, we could do float, integer, or double. That just means you have decimal points or not. I'm gonna keep it to integer because let's just keep it to the actual hill cells. And then what was the flow direction type? Well, we did, we stuck with the defaults, that was D8. So 
Let's go ahead and run that. All right, now we've got our flow accumulation raster. It's black and white. Black is zero, white is um, 9 million. 315,571. And of course, that value is going to be over here, right, um, at the outlet. So this is the Gunnison River. You click on that. That's our really big flow accumulation value. And then um, you can see where Cannon Creek comes in, right? Here's our Cannon Creek. And then it's kind of funny because this is the Gunnison River, but the values aren't that much simply because we don't have the full watershed upstream represented here. We just kind of truncated it um, over here. So it actually kind of disappears into nothing that way. Now, this is um, just stretched based on the, the colors. You, could, you can go in here and, and change the symbology, the color scheme to um, show colors a little bit better. And you could actually go in and edit this um, Let's see here. There's a way to, let's see. There's a way to kind of say at what point you want what certain colors to start. Um, so you can kind of make the streams pop a little bit better. But this color scheme gives you some more options. Mostly everything's gray, but then we have, of course, these streams here. Now, um, the question is, what, what do the values of the raster cells in the flow accumulation rap, raster represent? If I click on this right here, and I get um, 2,279,214, what does that number mean? What, so if I did flow accumulation, I don't know anything about water per se. How many cells are upstream exactly? So the next thing is it says use raster calculator to turn this into a drainage area um, flow accumulation raster where each cell has drainage area in miles squared. How do I do that? So I'm gonna go just double check here. Raster information. Um, Spatial reference. So we know that it's UTM 12N, linear units or meters. Okay, that's helpful. And then if we go to general, where is it here? Cell size. We're looking for cell size. Oh, there it is. Okay, 9.35. 9.35, so we can take this number, that's gonna be meters, and let's just go to Google and say, um, we're gonna do 9.35 times 9.35 meters squared in miles squared. This is how I do my conversions. All right, so this is what that is in miles squared. So each grid cell is 3.378 times 10 to the negative fifth miles squared. So now how do we go use that to then make this a drainage area raster? I'm going to go to raster calculator, take my flow accumulation raster, and then what do I do? So if I have if I have a flow accumulation value of one, and I multiply it by this, and I think we have to do let's see here e then this would be my drainage area in miles squared. I think that'll work with E, we'll find out. Okay. Okay, 
So I'm calling this one flow accumulation mile two, so mile squared. Let's run that. Okay, so now I've got my flow accumulation and it goes from zero to 314. So that is gonna be, let's go down to Canna Creek right here where my pour point is. Select on that. And it says we have about 135, 136 square miles upstream. We can check that with stream stats or something else. And we'll do that. So I just clicked on the cell and it says now, because we did the raster calculator, here's the, the drainage area in miles squared. I click over here and it's teeny tiny, right? All right, so that was a good step. Now, what's the next thing we're gonna do? So make sure to answer this prompt. What equation do you need to do this? Go ahead and document that. Um, what we can do is identify, we can um, color this so that it looks, we, we can kind of identify the drainage area threshold. Um, so I'm gonna go to click on this right here. And we're gonna do a different color scheme here. Um, let's go to classify. And then I'm gonna say, um, let's create a threshold. So we'll say anything less than one square mile. That's, that's arbitrary, but it's just something we'll do. Anything less than one square mile we'll say is no color. And then I'm gonna bring in the hill shade underneath so we can um, just see that gray, there we go. Anything less than one square mile is no color. And then we have these other colors all the way up. So what that does then is it's really teeny tiny because these are tiny cells, but it creates this drainage network that you can see now that stops at a mile, a square mile. All the way up to the mesa. And then you can see where it stops. So that's neat. Um, what we could do also is, uh, do I do this here? No, we're gonna do, go to watersheds, but I'll just talk about this really briefly. Um, if I go back to geoprocessing and I do raster calculator, I can take my flow accumulation and say, if it's greater than one, it's a stream. And then I would call that output raster. I would just call this uh, canna streams. I'll abbreviate it. Uh, rasters don't like really long names. So if I run that, yeah, greater than. So zero is less than, one is greater than. And then this is my, my stream lines. It's a grid. And then I could do, um, and I could make this no color again. So now I have all my uh, streams represented here just as, as binary. So one for stream, zero for not stream. And then I can go back to um, my geoprocessing and I can do raster to feature, I think. No, oh, raster to polyline. I can put this one in and it will take all the rasters um, that have values of one and background value zero. So that means zero is not gonna be a polyline. And then if I run that, we'll call that one um, and a streamline. Then now I get I get polygons. It's not super clean, and, and you can do some uh, you know minimum dangle length, right? You can reduce that so that it doesn't give you little appendages like that. But now I have a polygon for my um, streamlines or polyline for my streamlines. Little tangent there. But let's get back to the watershed exercise. Um, so 
the next step is to, now we've got our flow accumulation. We're going to uh, use that in the watershed tool to delineate a watershed. Right now I've got one pore point, which is right here, this little green dot. I already drew that in for you. If you needed to make a model where you're delineating all the sub basins for Canna Creek, you could create multiple pore points. So I could um, drop a dot right here. You want it to be over the raster. I could, um, and then that would all be in one shape file. I could drop a dot right here and, and have multiple pore points. And so if you had multiple pore points and ran the watershed tool, then you would get multiple sub basins delineated. So the first step we'll do is we will, um, we got our pore point shape file in there and we need to snap it to the raster streamlines. And so we'll use the snap pore point tool. That's okay. Um, so the pore point was part of the data that we downloaded. So bring in the um, pore point tool or the pore point, which is just one, and then search for snap pore point. Love saying pore so many times, pore point. Okay, here's our pore point data. The input pore point locations that are to be snapped. And that could be a raster, it could be a, a feature class, in this case, a point shape file. Um, if you have multiple ones, you want to differentiate them by some ID. We only have one. Now we need our accumulation raster. Use the original one. Don't use the mile squared one. So flow accumulation fill. And then output raster snap four point. That's great. The maximum distance to search for a cell of higher accumulated flow. So what it does is it takes your pour point, it looks around and looks for the highest uh, flow accumulation value. And then it snaps it to that cell. So snap distance, I'm just gonna put in, this is gonna be in meters. I'll just put in like uh, 30 meters. I, I, I drew that pour point right on top. So it's in, it shouldn't have anywhere to, to look, but you could put in a little search distance if you wanted. But you know what, you don't want to put it too big because it might snap it down here, right? It's going to look for the biggest value. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and make that just 10. Go ahead and run that. All right. So it searched 10 meters and yeah, it found that cell just downstream. That's fine. I don't, I don't care. If it, if it ever went too much, I don't want it to be down here on the Gunnison. So the pore point snapping is now a raster. That's just one grid cell. So you take a screenshot of that. Now we're gonna run the watershed tool. So I, I do that snapping pore point step because um, I've run into trouble with the watershed tool. It won't run correctly if I don't have that snapped raster pore point. So hopefully this will run for us. Watershed determines the contributing area. So there's there's a couple of different tools. Um, here's Watershed under Spatial Analyst, and here's Watershed, which is a ready to use tool. Um, this one is kind of like a little more prepackaged. You don't have to do all the steps. I think it costs mm -hmm. money, or you have to have like this special um, license with credits and stuff. So we're going to use this this one, the Spatial Analyst tool. We need a flow direction raster. So that's gonna be the flow direction that we filled. Flow direction fill. We need our pore point raster and that was snap pore points. And if I had multiple pore points, then I would have different values like two, three, four, five, et cetera. And that's the field you would look for. So it would delineate sub watersheds based on that, that value. All right, and then our output raster, we'll just call it um, Canna Watershed, Canna WS. 
and then I'll run it. All right, that tool took a couple of minutes to run and now we have a watershed delineated. So you can see how it includes a little bit of a drainage area coming off of that hill slope right there. Um, and then we'll zoom out and it goes all the way to the top. And I actually, look, I truncated the basin a little bit. It probably extends a little bit further out here. That's important to know because I clipped this DEM without knowing what the watershed boundary was prior. Um, so I missed a little bit of it. If you were doing this for a model or something, you'd want to go back and um, get more uh, coverage for your DEM. So there's our Cannon Creek watershed. That's nice. Um, take a screenshot. Now, the next step you'll do is you'll go to stream stats and do the same delineation and compare and um, take a screenshot of the comparison. You can download a shape file a polygon shape file from stream stats. And that's what you'll bring in here and overlay it with the raster one. You can also convert this to a polygon from raster. So if I go to geoprocessing raster to polygon, um, it'll put this raster in here. If you have more than one value in it, it'll create a polygon for each value. Um, you can simplify it so it's not too jaggedy. Minimum vertices per polygon. You don't want a little tiny, teeny tiny ones. Um, and then that'll create just a boundary. So you can compare those two. All right, good job team. We now have a watershed. There's a few more things we'll do. Um, we've got about seven more minutes. So we can use the flow length tool to create a raster of flow lengths. That's a pretty cool thing. I'll have you guys do that and visualize it. Um, note that the flow length is going to be, you can determine, is it going to be to the outlet or to the top of the basin? So here's one where we have the length to the outlet, but you could also make one where it'd be the length up to the top of the, um, to the basin. There's also the stream order tool. And you'll use that to um, create the stream order for this basin. Let's go ahead and just do that real quick. Um, so stream raster and the stream raster requires, let's look at that real quick, uh, represents a linear network. The input stream raster linear network should represent as values greater than or equal to one on a background of no data. So right now we have a raster that is, um, let's see here. Um, zero and one. So we want the zeros to be no data. So right now we don't have a good uh, stream raster. We need the background data be, to be no data. So we can use reclassify. Reclassify will take our stream raster. So can a stream right here. One is streams, zero is no streams. And we'll, we'll take all the zeros and we'll make them no data. So I'm just gonna say where zero is, make it no data. And then where one is, let's just make it keep that one. And then we'll call that um, and uh, stream one. So run that, it'll reclassify, <clears throat> reclassify everything. All right, so now it's just one in the no date in the background. Let's go to stream order again. We'll put in our new stream raster. We need a flow direction raster that helps it determine which um, where a, a tributary is. So flow direction would be our flow direction fill. And then our output raster, we'll call it um, Anna stream O for order. There's different methods for stream ordering. 
Strailer and Shreve, we'll just use the Strailer default. Stream order only increases when streams of the same order intersect. That's our, the basic definition that we use. This might be a good time to clean things up where when you're doing all these analyses, you get a bunch of unnecessary files. So we don't need the sync ones anymore. Let's remove that. Um, we don't want the old um, flow directions down here. So we can kind of get rid of the old flow direction. We don't need that original DM. Well, maybe we'll keep the original one. Remove the old hill shade. All right, let's take a look at our stream orders. We get up to a fourth order stream. So here are the colors. Let's go down and we'll click on this. Canna Creek is a fourth order stream. And that's based off of our definition of streams. We said streams begin at one square mile. If we had Streams begin a half a square mile. Do you think our order would go up or down? If we defined um, streams as as starting with a smaller drainage area, we would have more streams, right? We'd, you'd see more streams, a denser network. What would that do to the stream order? It would increase it. So maybe. This would have two tributaries and this would be a second order stream and, and this, you know, so you'd end up probably getting a, a higher order stream. So it's really just based on your definition here. You can see there's two third orders that come together, three and three, and that makes a fourth. A second order. Yeah. Okay. So now what we have is stream order for streams defined as having a drainage area greater than one mile squared. Now the last step you'll do is um, convert the streamlines to features and you can use this one, you can use the original one. Um, we already did that just as a kind of a, a tangent. So here's our, our features. So these are polylines, we can actually edit these, right? And what I ask you to do is opening an editing session by going to edit, modify, edit vertices. And what I want you to do is go find an area where we have an error. And um, I'll just zoom in for you. Let's see here, I'm gonna bring in the, um, we want to bring in the imagery. So let's go to uh, base map, map, uh, base map right here. And let's bring in imagery. I'm going to shut that, get rid of that watershed. And let's find an area where the stream kind of looks off. Huh. So here's a great example. This is Highway 50. We filled that DEM up, but what ended up happening is the stream went over here and then found a low point in the highway and then came over here. That's obviously not right. So let's go ahead and correct that in the editing session. So edit, modify, edit vertices. And then I can just click on that polyline and then I can move my vertices. So what I'm asking you to do is just move the vertices to follow the stream path and just do a decent job. You don't have to do a perfect job. You can use the existing vertices and then you can come down here and click on plus. That gives you a new vertex. So I, I've highlighted the plus and so every time I click on it, I get a new vertex. And just go ahead and finish that and then save it and then take a screenshot showing um, showing that you, you trace the new uh, flow path. Or the, the actual flow path, not the artificial one. 
So we'll just finish that real quick. All right, I'm gonna say that's like pretty good. Oh, I got a little twisted there. And then I don't wanna use those. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on delete. I can drag a polygon around and just delete the ones that I don't want, or I can click on them too. Delete, 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 delete. Great. I'll save that, save edits. And now our, our polyline, our streamline, I'll make that a little bit brighter, um, actually follows, uh, kind of follows the flow path a little bit better. I'd want to do a better job if I cared about the actual flow path. All right, and then now what you'll do is there's a couple questions at the end. Calculate the total stream length in miles within the watershed using this shape file. And then calculate the area in miles squared and percentage of the watershed above 7,500 feet. And that's important from a hydrologic standpoint where um, that's a somewhat arbitrary line where we say above that, most precipitation falls as snow and below that most precipitation falls as rain. So that's different flood generating mechanisms. And StreamStats actually uses this percent in their regression equations. So I will let you all figure out how to do that. I'm happy to um, go over that in office hours or after class. Yeah. Um, but real quick, um, if you open the attribute table for your streamlines, there's a shape length in there. So you can use that. Um, you just have to figure out what the units are. And you also have the original digital elevation model, which um, is what you'll use to calculate this. But it's gonna be in the watershed. So you're gonna to have to use the watershed boundary that you, calculate, you created. All right, that is all.